is always fair. I really enjoy repeating myself over and over again. I just love when the kids talk back to me. I don't care if you get a job this summer. I don't care if you get detention. Uh, uh, I, I can't open this jar. See if mom can open it. Just take your time in there, okay? No means maybe. Hey, why don't you bring that ball inside and play with it? Hey, don't put that back where you found it. Just leave it on the floor. Ew, bacon. If you put a dent in the car, it's really no big deal. It's 10 a.m. Go back to bed. Look, whatever your friends are doing, just do the exact same thing. I got more than enough sleep last night. If your friends are okay with it, then I'm okay with it. Stop signs are just a suggestion. You don't need a chaperone. You don't need a seatbelt. You don't need a savings account. You should buy the jeans with the holes in them. Hey, we're all gonna go to church, but you can just sleep in, okay? Can we please just hang out in here for another 10 minutes? Hey, can we get some more bickering back there? All right, bills! Yay, traffic! Woohoo, taxes! Yes! Laundry! Hey, can you kids come in here and jump on my bed? Quick, go tell mom what happened right away. You don't need to finish your dinner. Hey, look at your phone when I'm talking to you. I wish I had a smaller TV. We got you that phone for a reason. Texting boys. All right, everyone, listen up. Mom and I are going out of town this weekend, so please, mess up the whole house while we're gone. Please throw a few parties while we're gone. Please forget about the dog entirely while we're gone. Hey, when you're finished pouring that, can you just leave it out on the counter all day? Thanks. Hey, what are you doing? I'm gonna bungee jump out of this tree. That's a really good idea. everyone and welcome to Lakewood Alliance's Church Online. My name is Morgan Burkhoven, the Worship Director here at Lakewood and your host this morning. Wherever you're tuning in from, whether it be from your home, from your cabin at the lake, or from the other side of the world, we are so very glad to be able to spend this time with you this morning. If you are joining us for the very first time, you can let us know you're here by clicking the new here button at the top of this page. Of course, we are excited to hear what's going on in all of your lives. So if you could take a moment right now to add a comment to our chat section and tell us about a new opportunity that's arisen as a result of the pandemic, that would be awesome. I know it may sound a little bit weird, but the reality is a lot of new opportunities have presented themselves during this pandemic. So feel free to share one of yours. Maybe you picked up a new hobby. Maybe you were able to get some spring cleaning done. Either way, feel free to leave a comment. Here at Lakewood, our hope is to introduce you to Jesus and help you grow in your relationship with him. That includes small group gatherings, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and our online services. Our service today will run for a little more than an hour. Pastor Don will be hosting on the chat and Mel and Carla will be our prayer team today. After the service, we will have an opportunity to come onto a Zoom call where we can all hang out together and chat. Before we jump into our service though, we do have a few things to update you on about what's happening here at Lakewood. Through the month of June, Pastor Dave is hosting prayer times on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. You can email him at dave at lakewoodalliance.com to get the Zoom link for that. Second, we're going to be holding in fold our membership manual on Thursday, July 2nd at noon. If you've been thinking about taking a step into membership here at Lakewood Alliance, be sure to check it out. You can register by clicking on the link in the chat or at lakewoodalliance.com. Well, that's all for our announcements this morning. Please now, would you stand up and let's sing some songs of praise together before our God. One, two, three. Come set your rule and reign. In our hearts again, increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set the hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come and take us now. We are your church. Power in our 
the kingdom seen in us. Fill us with the strength of love of Christ. We are your church. We are the hope on earth. Build your O God, I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough.
As we prepare to hear the message from God's Word today, we're going to take a few minutes for prayer. To begin, I'm going to give you some space of quiet where you can just bring your stuff before Jesus this morning. Then, after some time has passed, I will lead us in a prayer all together. Would you bow your heads with me? God, we are so grateful. Thank you for bringing us all here this morning. Thank you for the things that you are doing in our lives. Thank you for the things that you are doing in this church. God, thank you for the things that you are doing in our relationships. Although this pandemic has desperately sought to separate us, Father, I feel like we have come closer together. And it is your Holy Spirit that has done that in us and for us. Thank you for everything you have done and are continuing to do. We do want to take a moment, Father, to just lift up those who are doing your work intentionally. We think of the Peters in Spain. Jesus, would you just lay your hand upon them? Wherever they're at, whatever they're doing, Lord Jesus, would they feel your very real presence? Would they know your companionship? Lord, would you just bestow on them such incredible wisdom and discretion and peace and love and joy, all of which transcend any human imagination or human understanding. Especially, Father, would you give them wisdom as they attempt to navigate ministry amidst this pandemic as well. Show them, Father, how they can um, see the things that you're doing and step into them to aid the work of your Holy Spirit. Father, I want to pray for all of our front of line workers, all of our leaders, everyone who is seeking to navigate this pandemic in a very real way on a daily basis. Would you give them incredible wisdom also, Father, that you ultimately will be directing their actions and their thoughts and their minds. Lord Jesus, I pray for peace within relationships. Lord, that you would break down barriers, that you would break down um, separation, anything that would come between people, Father, that you would unify us under you and through you only. Jesus, for us, for those in this congregation right now and for the work that we are doing, God, I pray that you would show us how to do more, that you would open up doors despite the limitations we're currently facing in our own lives and in the world at large and that we would have the courage to step into the spaces you're calling us to. Thank you for your goodness and your continued faithfulness and provision in our lives. Would we learn to rely on you so that we can do your will? In your heavenly name, I pray this. Amen. Hey, good morning, church. Just as we get ready for the message today, I uh, just want to introduce someone who's going to be a guest speaker to us today. Dwayne Taves has become a very good friend of mine works in our district office, has been a local church pastor in our district for many years, and uh, we're so excited that he's here to bring God's Word to us today. Dwayne's been up this past week working with both our board and the Timbers board, and the message he's prepared today, he's actually preaching for both us and Timbers, which he's able to do in multiple locations, even on multiple days, uh, all at once because of the way we're doing church these days. 
But I just want to welcome Dwayne and uh, just bless him to bring the word that God's laid in his heart for us today. Well, good morning, Timbers. Uh, good morning, Lakewood Alliance Church. It is so good to be with you. Uh, thank you to Dave and, and Andrew for inviting me uh, into your lives, into your service. And although I, I really wish I could be with you physically uh, in your sanctuaries, uh, we understand that we're, you know, we're living in fairly uh, unique times. And so online is going to have to do, but it really is a joy uh, to be with you. Um, my name is Dwayne Taves, and I'm one of our assistant district superintendents here in the Canadian Pacific District. And uh, my my title, if you will, um, is is that I'm responsible for something called new leader development. And so I'm, I'm primarily working, or I was primarily working with our pastors who uh, are exploring what ministry could be like through to about five years uh, down uh, the road in their in their ministry journey. And so I have the privilege of walking them through uh, things like licensing and, and ordination. Um, I also work with a lot of our, our policies and protocols in, in, in the district and help churches to do the same. Um, my heart really is to see our churches and, and our pastors become all that God has called them to be. And so I have the privilege of walking alongside of, of many of them, of, of many of you, uh, as our paths cross, and uh, we both endeavor to see the kingdom expand. But like so many of us, our, our roles have changed. Um, that was my title. That, that's, that's, what I, that's what I do. That's my job description. But since the middle of March until today, until now, um, I've had to become somewhat of a, an expert on COVID and uh, particularly how churches uh, re-enter and how, how we do ministry and how we adjust our protocols. And so I find myself living in that world uh, on a regular basis and uh, helping churches dream of new possibilities, helping churches explore um, what might be possible. In fact, I've had the privilege of working with both Timbers Board and and um, Lakewood's Board uh, uh, in, in mid in, in mid June here uh, to to kind of explore that. Uh, what can we do? Uh, what is our mission and our vision, and, and how do we continue to live into that? Needless to say, uh, it's it's interesting times, but God is good. I'm hearing story after story from churches of of how. God has proven himself faithful, and I know he will do that uh, in the city of Prince George as well. Just a little bit about me. Um, like I said, I've, I've been in the district office now for about uh, two and a half, two and three quarter years uh, in the particular role I was talking about. But prior to that, I was uh, a local church pastor in the Fraser Valley in a, in a little community called Yarrow. And I pastored a church of about 500 people. Uh, for, for 12 years, from about 2006 to mid-2017, I was their lead pastor. And from 2000 to 2006, I was their worship pastor. So I had the privilege of, of walking with a group of people for about 18 years. And uh, in 2017, I made the transition uh, into this role. And it's, it's, it's just been an absolute delight to work with the district team. Uh, my wife, Charlene, is a kindergarten teacher. Uh, and so... Like most of our teachers, uh, she's trying to figure out what her new normal is, uh, what classroom teaching is like, and, and how that's going to work, particularly in fall. Uh, my oldest son, Hayden, got re recently married uh, to Natalie. Uh, they, they were planning on getting married at the end of May, and they moved it up to the beginning of April because all of their plans had been canceled anyway uh, due to things out of their control. And so uh, we, we had to the pleasure of, of standing uh, beside our children as they got married uh, just a few months ago. And, and my youngest, Brandon, uh, he's, uh, he has his degree in, in music. He is a professional drummer. Uh, needless to say, my house is noisy most of the time as he lives in our basement. But uh, we, we love our kids. We, we have a great relationship with our kids and, and just really cool to see how God is growing them up in him. So, uh, yeah, it's a little bit about me. You know, 
I get asked this question a lot. And I, and I, like I said, I've been in the district office now for almost three years and I still get asked this question. What do you miss most about being in pastoral ministry? I mean, I'm still a pastor, but I'm not leading a, a local congregation. What, what do you miss most about that? And honestly, that, that's a pretty easy question for me to answer. I miss this. I miss being able to be in front of God's people and unpack God's word with them. And so let, let me just say to, to both congregations, Timbers and Lakewood, when I say it's a pleasure to be able to bring God's word to you today, I, I mean it. Uh, not only do I, do I pray that what I'm about to say will be God's words for you, uh, but they're God's words for me. And so I, I love uh, to open up God's word together. But, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge to sit on the other side of this camera. Uh, not only do I not know you, but I can't see you. Uh, you're on a journey. You are doing life, however it is that you're doing life, uh, in your own family, in your own community, in your own neighborhood, in your own job. You're on a journey. And I don't know that journey. And I'm on a journey, and, and you don't know my journey. And so what do you say? What does the pastor say when he doesn't know what's going on in your life? And God clearly impressed it upon my heart um, a number of years ago now, as, as I was beginning to do this kind of pulpit ministry from, you know, from church to church to church. You know, Dwayne, teach through the lens of your story. I've done something in your life. I'm continuing to do something in your life. And I want you to teach from that perspective. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you up to speed on a journey that I'm on. Uh, a journey that I've been on for a while. And uh, you see, my life hasn't always moved it forward in, in a straight line. A lot of times pastors get put on these pedestals. You know, everything, everything works out. Everything seems to, to make sense in their life. It hasn't in mine. Um, there have been bumps along the way. My family has experienced pain, confusion, um, some really difficult days. And in the midst of our difficult days, in the midst of my difficult days, and I'll share about that in a, in a few minutes, God led me to the book of Job. Um, and this is a book that I am typically hesitant to engage with. And let, let me explain that. You see, looking at the book of Job can be an exercise in frustration. I mean, for those of you who have read the story, you may know where I'm about to go. But if, if you're a person like me who likes things in your life to, to come at you in straight lines, if you want very clear answers to what you think are, are very clear questions, I, I would encourage you not to read the book of Job. <laughs> um, I, I've always had an issue with this guy. Um, if, if you think about the, the attribute, attributes that are typically um, attributed to, to, to Job, you, you think of things like patience. That, that's the one that jumps to mind for most people. If I was sitting in front of you, I'd ask you to, you know, or if I was standing in front of you, I, I would, this would be some group interaction. I would say, you know, what is the characteristic that is most likely or most often attributed to Job? And in almost, I, I know that most of you would say it's patience. Um, if my wife were sitting beside me here, you would, you, and you would see her on camera, you, you would see her rolling her eyes. And she would tell you that one of the characteristics that God, or one of the character qualities that God has not given me an overabundance of is patience. In fact, just a few years ago, our, uh, in, in our family, we went through a major house renovation. And when I say major house renovation, I mean, my wife and I were both working. Uh, we had no operating bathrooms in the house. The kitchen was simply a piece of, uh, like a plywood table. Uh, we were cooking in the toaster oven in the garage in the middle of summer. Uh, and this went on for months and months and months. I mean, we took the house down to studs. 
This is my, my wife's love language. She has all the patience in the world for the project to come together. And it drives me crazy. I don't have a lot of patience. And so when I read the story of Job, I, I get extremely frustrated to the point that I would just as soon skip over his letter, his book, his story. And so if you get frustrated with Job's story, just understand you're not alone. Um, you and I can talk later. You know, in the history of the church, Job is probably the character that has, you know, he appears least in writings and in works of art. Um, a number of years ago, I had the privilege of being in Italy and I took a tour of the Vatican and I remember walking down the hallways and, and seeing these massive frescoes on the wall, these, these works of art. I, I don't think I saw any of Job. When I was pastoring in Yarrow, I actually did a multi-week series on the book of Job. And I remember I had a buddy who was, who was uh, not living in, in our town and he said he was going to, he was going to drive out one Sunday and he was, you know, just going to come and visit the church and we were friends. And he said, what are you preaching on? I said, I'm going to preach on Job. And uh, he never showed up. Job makes us uncomfortable. Um, you know, he hits really close to home. Here, here's how it begins. And, you know, if you've got your Bibles and you're, you're sitting at home and you're, and you're watching uh, this, this video feed, I, I'd encourage you to open up your Bibles or your Bible app to the book of Job and don't close it because we're going we're gonna to look at a number of, of passages um, throughout this talk. But here's how Job begins. Here's chapter 1, verse 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. That's how it begins. Why don't you pray with me before we start to unpack uh, this very interesting um, scriptural passage. God, I thank you for, for those who are represented, um, the families that are represented virtually today, who are watching on their, on their computer screens or on their TV screens or on their phones. Father, I ask that you would meet them where they're at. God, I ask that you would teach them something new, something that they would be able to apply to their life and to their situations that they find themselves in, even in the midst of, of, of what kind of feels like chaos in our world. God, would you teach us? Open up our minds and our hearts to receive from you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So that's how the story begins. You know, in verse one, we, we find out very, very quickly that Job's a good guy. Um, he's a godly man. Things go really, really well for him. He's wealthy. He, he has this amazing family. If you go on to read, you find out that he has seven sons and three daughters, which kind of sound, sounds crazy to me, but massive family. He worships the living God. He is appreciative of everything that he has. In other words, Job is a very good man whose life has gone very well. And why shouldn't things go well? He's got a strong faith. He's got a grateful heart. You kind of assume things are going to go well for him in his life. Right? Isn't that the way life's supposed to work? We, we worship the living God, we, we listen to scripture, we lean in, life's supposed to go well. But the story takes this very unexpected turn. In this bizarre conversation between God and, and Satan, you know, scripture sometimes called, calls Satan the accuser. You see, as God enjoys Job's righteous devotion, his obedience to him, Satan starts to mock God. And I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially Satan says this to God. Of course, of course, Job worships you. Of course he does everything he can to please you. You've coddled him. You've given him everything he wants it would be radically different 
if Job didn't have so much. And God essentially says, all right, Satan, let's, let's test out that theory. And in the blink of an eye, Job's various herds are stolen by these raiding bands, bands of enemies. Uh, his servants are killed kind of in the next blink of an eye. And then there's this driving windstorm that collapses his house and kills his entire family. This is utter destruction. And yet the Bible says that still Job does not lash out against God. And so Satan, the accuser, has a second conversation with God. And it goes like this, and you find it in Job chapter 2. And I'm beginning at verse 3. Here's the second conversation. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But if you stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he's in your hands but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Why don't you curse God and die? And he replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all of this, get, get this, in all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. I have a problem with this story. This story kind of bugs me. Job's conversations with or, or pardon me, God's conversations with, with Satan make it seem as though human life is somewhat of a game for God. That we as human beings are merely some pawns in this celestial chess game that's going on. That's, that's what it feels like at first glance. But at the same time, there is this disturbing resemblance to real life here in this story. No matter who you are, Painful things happen in life. No matter how good you are. No matter how much we love God. No matter how much we worship or live with a grateful heart. Businesses fail. People betray. COVID strikes. Friends die. You see, faith in God does not come with immunity from life. And, and this statement, faith in God does not come with immunity from life. This statement, given everything our world is currently experiencing, given everything that the church is currently experiencing, it is more poignant than ever. Faith in God doesn't come with immunity from life. Which leads me to this question. Then what good is faith? Because deep down inside, uh, I think there are many that kind of believe that life with God is, is this, it's kind of like this negotiated agreement. God, I'll live the way you want if you protect me. God, I'll, I'll do what you want me to do as long as I'm happy. Or, or whatever you think at a, at a core level God's part of the bargain is. But what good is living well if God doesn't come through with his part of the bargain? Because that was Job's wife's question. And that's so often our question. But perhaps maybe a better question would be this. What is God's part of the bargain? Maybe there's no bargain at all. You know, think about people in your life while we're talking about Job here that, that are going through deep valleys. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a coworker. Think about those people where life seems to be pretty chaotic right now. Keep them in mind as, as we journey through this. So the story continues. Job's got these three friends, and they're great friends. 
Um, they hear about the tragedies that have fallen upon Job and, and they, they come to him, they want to console him, they want to comfort him. And for seven days, they say nothing. They just sit with him. Their ministry to Job in those days is not one of advice. They're not trying to fix his problems. They're not trying to make sense of it all for him. It simply is a ministry of presence, and it is a powerful ministry. I mean, those of you who have experienced painful tragedies in your life, you know the value of a person who is wise enough to merely come and be with you. Sometimes we put far, far too much value on words. I, re I remember... A um, little bit of my story here. In, in 1983, my, I was 13 years old. My, my sister was 11 at the time. Her name was Carmen. And she was diagnosed with a condition called, uh, it's a long name, but essentially the acronym is AVM. There, there were a massive blood vessels in the part of the brain where there ought not to be a bunch of blood vessels. And she developed a, a, a tremor. Um, she, be, she had to learn to write with her left hand instead of her right hand. And the doctor described her condition to our family as uh, a, a ticking time bomb. And Carmen lived from 1983 with that condition and God saw fit to take her home in 2002. And I remember when she had her aneurysm and she's laying in the hospital and I'm, and I'm there and I, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying goodbye and I'm trying to process. And I remember some of my friends that gathered in the family room with us and they just sat with us. They didn't try to say anything. They didn't try to do anything. They were just there. Ministry of presence. Sometimes the greatest help we can be to people whom we love, who are, who are in deep pain, is to acknowledge, you know, I wish I could flip the light switch and make it all go away, but I can't. And just sit with them. And in fact, when you, when you think about the story of Job, even though he's in shock, I mean, the guy's in shock. Even though he's in pain, deep pain, in some respects, everything is fine as long as his friends are quiet. And then all of a sudden in the story, Job begins to grieve out loud. Like, I mean, he's processing his grief here. And, and then all of a sudden, the answers begin to pour forth from his friends. And, and there's later this fourth friend who joins them. And, and the answers that the friends give Job are not superficial. They're not glib. They are, in fact, the kind of answers that Job probably would have given them if the shoe were on the other foot. They're theological answers. I don't, I don't think they're great theological answers. They are answers that have been given to people over the course of history. And, and essentially, uh, the, the answers that the friends give Job are, are kind of go like this. You know, Job, you, you think you're innocent, but surely you've sinned. God doesn't allow this kind of thing to happen to people who are righteous. Why don't you fess up, take your medicine like a big boy, God won't reject a blameless person. And Job's friends are insistent over and over again with increasing irritation. They encourage Job to submit to the fact that somehow it is his sin that has caused this calamity in his life and somehow it will be his confession and his repentance that will win God's hand of favor back into his life. And this is not just a story. This is not something that just happens outside of our lives. It's not just rhetorical. When my sister passed away in 2002, I had people, friends of mine, I remember coming to me, asking, carefully asking, but they were asking, what was going on in her life that caused this? What was going on in our family's life that caused this? And my response to them isn't, wasn't very pastoral, so I won't tell you what my response was. But there are people who believe that it's our sin that causes this kind of judgment from God on our life. Hmm. You see, in both their consoling and in their berating, Job's friends speak about God to Job. They talk theology. I think it was bad theology. 
They, they philosophize. But what is so frustrating for Job is, is that he actually wants God to speak to him. In fact, in chapter 30, verse 20, Job says this, I cry out to you, God, and, and you don't answer me. I, I stand and you merely look at me. You, you can sense his frustration here. For 35 chapters in the book of Job, we only hear the voices of Job and his friends. And then finally, in chapter 38, God speaks. And you get the impression that God is going to make everything better. God is going to give answers to the questions that Job has been asking. And so let me just read just a, a small portion of God's response to Job. Chapter 38, let me beginning at verse 2. Again, there's a storm going on in Job's life. He's questioning, he's asking questions, his friends are asking questions. And here's God's reply, part of God's reply. Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or, or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? And he goes on. Honestly, in God's reply, it sounds like there's no answers to the questions that Job needs. Maybe there are no answers. Maybe there are only questions. Conservatively, there are 58 questions or at least 58 question marks in this text over the next three chapters from God. All questions of God asking Job, can you do something? Do you understand something? And if Job was going to be honest with himself and with God, he would have had to say to every one of God's questions, no, I don't, no, I can't, no, I won't. Job hears nothing from God that gives him the answers to the questions that he and his friends have been arguing about. But something profoundly important happens. Job hears from God. Not about God, but he hears from God. And apparently that's what Job needs. That, that's what I needed in the midst of my darkest days. Job needed to know, I needed to know that I wasn't forgotten. Job needed to know that he was significant. Job knows um, now that, that he matters to God because out of the whirlwind that was his life, God speaks to him. In fact, one theologian puts it this way. It's as though Job says, at last God has spoken. Just talk to me, God. I don't care what you say. Just talk to me. Why doesn't he get any answers, though? I don't know. Maybe it's because if God answered every single question, point by point by point, it still wouldn't have been satisfying for Job. You know, if... if if Job said, God, why have all these terrible things happened in my life? And God said something like this. You know, Job, the, the world isn't the way I intended it to be. People are not the way I created them to be. Sin has entered in, and because I haven't pulled the, back the ability for mankind to, to freely choose, you know what? Horrible things happen. For someone who's lost their livelihood, for someone who's lost their reputation, for someone who's lost a sister, that's not a satisfying answer. Hmm. For Job, what seems satisfying is simply that God speaks. And Job receives what he needs. I received what I needed in God's attention. And we know this is true of Job because in chapter 42, when Job replies to all of God's questions, it's a very different Job who replies. It's a very different tone that we hear from Job. Chapter 42, verse 2. Job says, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, 
and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. At the end, Job finds peace with God. It's an uneasy peace, granted. Um, and it doesn't come at the end of his sufferings. It doesn't come in spite of his sufferings, but somehow it comes in the middle of them. Job continues to endure. And having been assured of God's presence, Job rather surprisingly, he repents. And he doesn't repent of the secret things he's done or he hasn't done, but he repents of trying to act like God. He repents of trying to tell God what God is supposed to do, of trying to be God. He says, I have uttered what I did not understand. So that's the story. What does Job's story bring out in us? What does it build inside of us? Let me show you what it, or let me tell you um, what it built inside of me. And the first thing is this, Job's story showed us, showed me, that a relationship with God, that my relationship with God is not some sort of a negotiating session. It's not a bargaining issue. I don't consent to act a certain way, providing God is obligated to act a certain way in return. In fact, I know this doesn't sound overly pastoral, but the ground rules, if you will, are, are set by God, not me. And what Job's speech in chapter 42 uh, finally realizes is that he doesn't see anything like the whole picture. God, in essence, says to Job, you can't understand the marvels of the physical world. How are you going to ever understand the spiritual world or something like eternity? Our relationship with God is not a negotiated session. Secondly, Job's story reaffirms for us that God has chosen to stay in relationship with you and me, with, with us as human beings. We are significant because God has chosen us. There was this conversation that was started by God that, that he actually hasn't stepped away from. And we get a hint of it here in Job, but we see it most clearly, and this just puts a smile on my face, we, we see it most clearly when we flip ahead to the New Testament and we look at the story of Jesus. And I know it's important, you know, hermeneutically uh, to, to always uh, read the Old Testament on its own merits. But ultimately, as Christ followers, we read the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. And part of the unfolding mystery that, that God saw, part of the, the picture that Job just doesn't understand, we actually see in the person of Jesus. Job shows God as powerful and creative and mysterious and actually sometimes silent. A God who might even allow suffering to come upon people whom he loves. But in Jesus, we see an intimate and compassionate God. A God who knows exactly what suffering is, who knows what injustice is, and actually is present with us in the middle of it. A God who is capable of taking even the worst evil the hardest suffering, the worst pestilence and disease, and bringing good out of it. There's a professor at Yale Divinity School, one of my favorite authors, a guy by the name of Dr. Uh, Nicholas Walterstorff. And in 1983, uh, the same year that my sister was diagnosed with her condition, uh, Walterstorff's son, who was 24 years old at the time, was mountain climbing in Austria, and he died tragically. And as you can imagine, this dad went through intense years of pain. And he was persuaded by his colleagues to publish his, his thoughts, his lament, um, in this little book called Lament for a Son. And, and I commend this book to you. It was published in 1987, Lament for a Son. And it's this marvelous, honest account of suffering. It's an honest account of pain. I think it speaks to what we're going through as a society, as a world, as a country right now. It speaks about pain like Job's. Even words like Job's. You know, listen to these thoughts that come directly from the book. One of the quotes is this, Oh God, I learned to spy you in the light, but here in the darkness I can't find you. 
And here's a question that comes out of this book that I use very often when I'm interviewing uh, uh, ordinance uh, for ordination, particularly worship pastors. He asks this question, are there songs for singing when the light grows dim? Later on, he writes, through the prism of my tears, I have seen a suffering God. Instead of explaining our suffering, God actually shares it. Walter Storff is like Job to me. Neither Job nor Walter Storff would, would accept easy answers because there were none. But neither of them would quit talking to God. Neither of them would quit talking to God. And so when I finished reading the book of Job after my sister had passed away, I remember putting my, putting my Bible down one day and, and asking myself this question. And it's the question I want to leave you with this morning. I think it's an important question. Will you stay in the conversation with God regardless of your circumstances? When life is no fun, when the pain is great, when the lockdown feels like it's never going to let go, when there are no easy answers, will you stay in the conversation? Because that would take great faith. It would take great endurance. In fact, Job's famous patience is actually better translated endurance. And Job's enduring answer to the question of whether or not he'll stay in the conversation with God is yes. It's not unlike the question that most of us as married couples face. You know, when my wife Charlene and I don't agree, don't understand each other, and remember we went through a major renovation in our house, when we, when we argue, when we have different priorities, it always comes down to this bottom line. Even when it's hard, even when we don't understand, will we keep talking? Will we keep listening? Will we try another angle? Will we ask another question? Will we back off and, and start over again? Or, like so many people, will we just throw our hands up in the air and withdraw? I'm out. Will we stay in the con conversation? When Job felt God's absence, he was angry. He cursed his own birth. He demanded answers. He shouted at God. He wept. All ways of staying in the conversation. Sometimes we might even call them prayer. None of them seemed to bother God in the slightest. In the book of Job, God can seem unfathomable. He can seem absent. He can seem distant. Yet he speaks. In Jesus Christ, God has drawn near. And he's made provision for our repentance in his own suffering, in the unjust suffering and death of his own son, Jesus Christ. He has said to each of us, yes, I will know you. Yes, I will not abandon you. Yes, I will save you. Perhaps, just perhaps, that's his part of the bargain. But we know that it's not a bargain at all. It is God's grace. It is the good news of the gospel. And so Lakewood and Timbers, when times are tough, will you stay in the conversation? Will you stay in the conversation? It will require the patience of Job and it will require the love of Christ. That's my prayer for you. That's my hope for you. Would you allow me to pray? God, I thank you for what you're doing in the city of Prince George through Lakewood and through Timbers. Father, I pray that they would be beacons of light in the midst of darkness. You know, we live in a world right now that just seems to be spinning out of control. Um, and I ask God that you would shine your light in the midst of the paths that those who are watching and listening today are walking. For those who are, who are struggling with life, who are struggling with life because of sickness and disease or because of, of unemployment or, or family strife, God, would you draw near and let them know that they're not walking alone? And Father, for those who are going, you know what, we're, we're doing okay, would you enable them to proclaim how good you are to people around them, bringing hope and joy to darkness? Father, thank you that you are a God who doesn't give up on us. Father, may we stay in the conversation with you. 
as we follow hard after Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, Dwayne, thanks so much for leading us in God's word this morning and for leaving us with such an important and powerful challenge. And church, may we truly be staying in the conversation with God in these challenging days. We want to take a bit of time now, just before we finish up today, to process a bit with God the things that he's been saying to each one of us. And so in your home, just want to encourage you to spend some time either taking some time in quiet prayer, uh, singing along with our worship team as they lead us in a song right now, or maybe just taking some time to pray with someone else by clicking on the live prayer button and praying with our prayer team today. Also during this time, there's an opportunity to give back to God some of what he's given to us as an act of worship, an act of thanks for all that God has provided for you. So why don't we take this time and spend it with the Lord, just exploring what he would want to say to us today, the things that we need to bring to him today, and allowing him to minister to our hearts.
Father, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. Thank you that we can depend on you and that you will never leave us or forsake us. Father, we confess that we need you no matter what our circumstances are, whether we're in a season of joy or if we're struggling, Lord, we need you. And God, as we, I pray as we look to a new week, Father, I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts, that we would be able to see you walking with us and feel your peace, the peace that passes all understanding. In Jesus' name. So um, just a reminder that if you'd like to join our uh, Zoom meeting after the service, there will be a link in the chat box, I believe. Um, so yeah, check that out. We're going to finish this service with a blessing um, that we want to sing over you. It's called The Blessing. Um, we just want to encourage you today, church, and have you encourage each other by singing this song. So please join us.
their children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and their children.